got we did the recording in progress and then we paused it. It was at one of our one of our interest meetings, and that was when we forgot to unpause. <laughs> I did I did it again in our first lesson. And I forgot to unpause. Did you? Because <laughs> I went, I was like, why is it only two minutes long? <laughs> oh, did you just get like the first two minutes and that was it? Yeah. Or or something. Because we got it all set up before people before we actually spoke. I have it set to automatically record as soon as I log in. That's why, because otherwise I will forget. So, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, I watch it. And, uh, so bright. I can. You would. Would you like some mood mood lighting? I could adjust the the lighting. Actually, might be hard to see, girl. <laughs> I have mood lighting. Why? Yeah. I paid extra for that one. Mood <laughs> lighting. It is kind of better. Yeah. That is okay. There is a lot of classrooms that mm, speakers, microphone. I, I wrote my name in seven. <laughs> I can't say it. Okay. I'm going to go. We have the, the alphabet sitting in our kitchen. Do you need the handout? Yeah, sorry. Oh, can you get in the Yeah. Do you have a sheet? Oh, well, I don't think. Do you, did you get really Yeah. You know, there'll be someone named Hans from like Germany, and mm -hmm. named like Han from China, but they're all just kind of Han. It's like, it really gives no like context either. It's just like, this is a foreign name. <laughs> no idea who it might be. Okay. I think this will be us for today. Thanks, Let's everybody. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. We can get the first five minutes up here on, on the recording. Yeah. We have um the haymakers that are just that are gonna be running late. So but. okay. All right. Uh first I'm gonna start just flashcards again in case anybody has any more questions that come up. And Thank you. if you don't have uh, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could sit way over there, but I wouldn't be able to see the power. Way over there. Would you do it in Very long. Chris. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Are you on? Are you on? So, is there everybody? I think so. Okay, let's get started. So, everybody, hello. We're here for lesson number two on our, you know, Japan 101 kind of basic stuff. And first, I want to say, are there any questions that maybe from the newsletter or from the last lesson that carried over? If you guys have any questions to just at, just at the beginning, uh, like the in case. Was fabulous. Thank you. I was so terrified. Like two days ago, I got an email that my like YouTube account for that email got just deleted. And I huh? was like, I apparently was suspended for like various and repeated violations. I was like, this is a new account I made two weeks ago. <laughs> I haven't even like watched a single YouTube video on it. And they banned it. Sorted? Or is it? Is it, it got sorted. I had the email and just like wait two days, but the link should work again, but they were all broken. I was like, I made such a nice newsletter. 
for all the links to be just completely broken, like this channel does not exist, <laughs> but it works. So hopefully that's fine. And if it happens again, I'll just read it over. But okay. Yeah, so any questions just uh, beginning? Okay, feel free to ask throughout uh, as well. You're welcome. Okay. So we're gonna start off again with culture. Yeah, come on in everybody. Um, our culture topics for today are Japanese history, which was mentioned a bit on the newsletter, and uh, foods and etiquette, this is specifically food etiquette, but we can kind of talk about more uh, if you've got any questions. So just starting a little bit with Japanese history. So Japan has a very long history. Um, if you compare it to like the United States, it goes back a lot longer. So there's just a lot more to kind of study uh, like a deeper, you know, ancient kind of history. And there are many distinct periods. Uh, currently we're, we're in Reiwa is the new period that had started in 2019 when the past emperor stepped down and the new emperor stepped up um, and his coronation. So the periods are related directly to like the emperors. Usually it's their lives, like with like the British monarchs, but sometimes they can also step down um, just because they don't particularly want to do it anymore. So yeah, right now we are in Reiwa. It's, it's R-E-I-W-A. Uh, might say Reiwa. Reiwa. So that's the current period. And there are actually, you know, it's a little bit debated because, you know, historians like to argue about things sometimes. There are basically 16 periods going back several thousand years. Um, basically like, you know, the prehistoric people that entered Japan, you know, through Asia, crossing from Korea and China and those places. Uh, and then after that, it's consecutively 16 periods up to modern times. Uh, and they're each kind of interesting to learn different points of, you can kind of see how humanity progresses through Japanese history and it's basically well documented the entire time. So that's an interesting feature is that you can go back um, kind of similar to Chinese history. They have a recorded history going back very far. So it's interesting that you can kind of take a deep dive uh, into these things if you're interested in learning like academically about history. But even more so than that, it's interesting because you see it in person when you're in Japan. So there are gonna be you know, temples and shrines and buildings you'll see that are over a thousand years old, sometimes several thousand years old. And they'll tell you it's made you know, in so-and-so era, so-and-so period. If something was made in Reiwa, you know, it's three years old at max because it's 2019. <laughs> if something was made in Showa, that's kind of from the end of World War II to maybe 1984 or something like that. Uh, and there are kind of different ones there. So if you kind of learn like the big five or six, you'll know like what period people are talking about when they're like, this is a temple from the Kamakura age or the Edo period. Uh, those, those all have like distinct ranges that are good to know to understand kind of how culturally significant some of the temples that you might see are. And let's see, oh yes. Uh, the current emperor of Japan is Nar Naruhito. Naru, N-A-R-U, Hito, H-I-T-O. It is one word, sorry. <laughs> I made it space it out, but it's one name. Uh, you mind repeating the second part of the name? Yeah, it's Naruhito, N-A-R-U-H-I-T-O. That's the current emperor. And uh, previously, they all kind of have like a, a naming scheme that they follow consecutively. I believe his father was Akihito, and then before that was like Haruhito or something like that. I think that was the one during World War II. Uh, and it goes back like that kind of they take one part of the name, put it on the next one. Uh, so I guess there's probably a fun way to memorize all of them going back in uh, quite a long time. Similar to probably other like maybe European centric monarchies that you might have heard of, they do have like a religious tie saying that the emperors get their power from uh, a certain god. It wasn't a Christian god, their god, I believe, starting like uh, a sun god. I believe it was. Amaterasu is the god, uh, which you might hear about if you kind of look into Japanese folklore and, and really ancient history and some religious stuff as well. Uh, that name would come up. So 
you can see the emperor is kind of really ingrained in Japanese culture through a long period of time. Uh, although it's not so important in day-to-day -day life, it's kind of like uh, the British royal family right now. Some people might be really into it uh, and follow it closely, but for the most part, they keep up really private life. They don't have any political power. They're just like a figurehead of the state. Uh, that's the current status of the, the, the emperor. They don't really have an empire, so it's funny to call them emperor. <laughs> okay. Oh, and you can, I think I'm out of, oh yeah. So some historical <laughs> figures, um, kind of a big importance to the forming of Japan as the country it is now. It kind of begins around the time of Oda Nobunaga. So he was a powerful daimyo and his, his, um, his goal was to unite Japan during the feudal period. Uh, his main tactic there was through war. He wanted to conquer all the other kind of areas and regions of Japan and bring them under his power. Did we define daimyo? Um, daimyo is a bit of just a warlord okay. kind of thing. Um, it is from like, you know, the feudal age. So, you know, as you can imagine, it's it's a lord of some kind. Um, and this would lead to the creation of like the shogun, which is like, you know, a, an all powerful kind of leader, military leader of Japan who conquered, who controls the country <laughs> through like force armies, battles and stuff like that. So Oda Nobunaga, is a name that you might hear a lot if you're looking into Japanese history. It's kind of the first name that comes up um, like once they started um, interacting with the West, I would say. So he was the first um, Japanese kind of military power to start using uh, guns, for instance. And they were kind of more primitive guns from Portuguese traders. Uh, but that's his uh, time period. And another kind of important name you might hear is Tokugawa Ieyasu. His first name is, or I got it confused, I don't actually know. I think, yeah, I Ieyasu. Some people might turn it really quick and do Ieyasu, like just all the vowels get squished together there. So Ieyasu. So it's an I. Yeah, it's an I, not a like, <laughs> And they call him the father of the Edo period. Uh, some of you might know Edo is the old name of Tokyo. So this is when they kind of formed uh, a new capital called the Edo period. That's Edo, which is you know, it's in a politics and everything else in the country. So Tokugawa Ieyasu was pretty important. These kind of go in order. So Oda Nobunaga was down the line, succeeded by Tokugawa Ieyasu. And he was still, he, he did work to unite Japan, kind of bring it into the modern age at the time, but it weren't, wasn't quite there yet, still kind of semi-feudal. And another name, which personally I haven't heard of much, but I'm sure um, people studying Japanese history more closely, kind of closer to the, uh, the integration of Western, uh, like habits and customs into Japan, to Japan, was Sakamoto, Sakamoto Ryoma. And he was a samurai at the end of the feudal period in Japan. So basically one of the last samurai because after the feudal period came the Meiji Restoration and that led to kind of a more Western military style in Japan. So these are three important figures. And specifically I know for Oda Nobunaga, you can watch a show about him on Netflix. I believe it's called, uh, I have a note here, Age of Samurai Battle for Japan. That's so, a good one. Yeah, uh, it's on Netflix. I believe it's uh, just a handful of episodes, not, yeah. but they're all kind of long. <laughs> Maybe we're in an hour, 40 minutes, or 40 minutes to an hour. Age of Samurai mm -hmm. is Battle it, for is Japan. It, is it appropriate? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's like one scene in the first episode. <laughs> but it's not no, no it's, it's, I'd say it's PG thirteen. Yeah, PG thirteen. Uh, I'm 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 not sure what the exact rating is on Netflix, but I think it's about PG thirteen. Yeah, it's you know like a historic battle reenactment. Yeah, and stuff like I, that. I didn't it's not see a bad. lot of blood and guts and gore or yeah. any sex scenes. Either. Not too much. It's all about the history of taking over like the yeah. battle for power. Um, 
And I think that will help kind of contextualize these names a lot because you'll learn directly about Oda Nobunaga uh, as a figure, but also specifically kind of who he was as a person because that was also well recorded at the time. And then it leads on to describe the situation in Japan. Because I guess maybe we don't have like a great picture of what ancient Japan might've been like, or you know, much of the ancient world, unless you're really into history, it might be hard to figure out like, what exactly does a feudal system look like, especially so far back? So that really helps contextualize uh, the history of Japan a bit. Um, in terms of other people, like historical people in Japan you might have heard of, it's much more like contemporary history, but uh, the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, you probably heard in the news, he was uh, assassinated. I guess it would be an assassination. Um, this year, earlier yeah, this year. Just a couple months ago. Yeah, and that was really shocking for Japan because of their kind of low crime rate, like strict tolerance on no guns, you know. So that was a more modern bit of history, like a very historical moment for Japan that we kind of saw in the modern times. He was the first diplomat that's been assassinated since before World War II. So, it's 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 a big deal. It's shocking because you know yeah. we, we might hear about assassinations in history, but when do you see one so public, so you know, mm -hmm. well documented in the media? Um, and he's also basically the most well known uh, prime minister Japan has ever had because there were like post war prime ministers that did a lot of good for the country, and others that were really um, controversial, controversial, but. Uh, he had the longest run, both like consecutive and all total something like over 20 years as prime minister. So really influential. Uh, and if you kind of look up something about him, it also helps to see kind of Japan and their current political landscape. Um, the way that some people are still reacting to the changes after World War II and how kind of, you know, Everything got tossed up in the air and how the chips landed. Some people aren't happy with uh, how Japan is at the moment. Uh, so it's interesting that you can kind of see through learning about him, what's going on in the present. And just to talk to you about more famous Japanese people that you might know, there is uh, Naomi Osaka, the tennis player, I believe. She mm -hmm. is doing very well in her sport and she's, Kind of beloved in Japan as well. Uh, people were very proud of her going into the last Olympics and then the Olympics got delayed and then everybody kind of simmered down. But uh, yeah, people uh, like Japanese school kids everywhere kind of look up to her as well, as well as the um, basketball player uh, Rui Hachimura. He plays, I think, for like the Washington Wizards, something like that. I think I saw. So um, you know, basketball isn't so big of a sport in Japan, but it is growing in popularity. So for there to be a current uh, NBA player, they are really excited about that. And, oh, in the world of baseball, baseball is a very popular uh, sport in Japan. So you might've heard of uh, Ichiro Suzuki. Uh, is he, he's in the Mariners, I think, the Mariners. And then Shohei Otani, I believe he plays for the Angels the Dodgers, one of the LA teams. Yeah. Uh, so they are kind of well-known current um, Jap figures from Japan. Uh, and they are as beloved in Japan as they are outside. So it's really interesting. And I think I have heard of like an up and coming baseball person, uh, baseball player in Japan. I've seen him play in person. Um, his last name is Murakami. His first name is harder to remember. Uh, and he, I think he currently plays for Tokyo, one of the Tokyo teams. And he will probably end up playing in America because he is out of this world in Japan. Like he's really shocking them uh, with how good he plays. So you might start hearing the name Murakami, you know, in the next couple of years. Is that a summer sport there like it is here? Yes, I think it might go, well, I don't know much about baseball here, <laughs> but I think it, yeah, it 
it's like World Series is usually yeah. played in uh, like last games usually played in October, November. Right around there. Yeah. yeah. Where the, the regular season is. Mm -hmm. I think it's about the same. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think their yeah. preseason starts as early as March because I was looking for like tickets if I ever wanted to go. Like, when, when can you go see soccer and baseball? Because that would be perfect. Uh, so, yeah, I think like spring, you might be able to catch some preseason games and summer, it's sort of like fall. Uh, and baseball there is really exciting to see in person. They play a little differently um, than people over here. And the fans celebrate differently. They are, there are like customs where somebody will have like a big drum and they're going the entire time. And there's a chant, you have to know all the chants. Like if you go to one game, you will know all the chants by the time you leave because it's nonstop. <laughs> um, they have, you know, like fun balloons that they kind of release everywhere and it looks crazy. And of course, they pick them all up afterwards. <laughs> I mean, World Cup, they're all they're yeah. cleaning up the stadiums. <laughs> yeah. So, and they, you know, they do that over there as well. They will, like, yeah. for the most part, clean it up. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if you could, I don't know, it might be really hard to fit your itinerary. That's what I was asking. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, many. Like the six of us between March and October. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we'll be there, but. <laughs> It would be it'd be really great. I know specifically I went to go see the Hiroshima carp play because I was in Hiroshima. It was about a one and a half hour train ride. So I would leave immediately from work at like 4.15, get on the first train and show up, try to get there by the game at six. And uh, luckily the baseball stage, the baseball stadium in Hiroshima is like a 10 minute walk from the main train station. So That's barely awesome. it, but <laughs> it's exciting. That's cool. Yeah, baseball is beloved in Japan. Um, Soccer as well, but those are basically the main two. Yeah. Okay. And oh, I also want to speak about artists. Uh, I'm not too caught up with like current um, music in Japan. I do want to kind of like look into it. I know a couple artists, but uh, in terms of like art, you know, painters and stuff like that, uh, you might have heard of Hokusai. Hokusai uh, did the painting, several like notable paintings uh, a long time ago. Uh, you might know, like, I believe the giant skeleton, kind of like scaring people. That's, it's either him or in his same era. So, you know, kind of the style that we're looking at. Also the, the wave, I believe yeah. it's the yeah. wave of like, Kanagawa or something with the big yeah. wave and the men on boats. Uh, that's also Hokusai. H-O-K-U-S-A-I. Yeah. Uh, Hokusai. Uh, he's very good. And Is the more, word too? one word, yeah, Hokusai. Um, I believe it might have even just been not his real name. His like, artist name. Yeah, his, his artist name. name. Yeah. Uh, I think he might have had like a really easy, like, boom, boom, real name. And he was like, no, I got to stand out. Hope it's like, <laughs> more memorable. Um, in contemporary art, uh, this one is hard. <laughs> it's Yayoi as, 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 uh, Kusama. Kusama. Yeah, Yayoi Kusama is, uh, she does kind of big, um, not quite interactive, but sometimes interactive um, like art pieces. So you might have seen pictures of like a room full of mirrors and also like colorful orbs that you can walk in and walk through the mall. Um, a lot of really interesting art. Uh, I believe she has exhibits in Arkansas. I think I saw some of the pieces at uh, Crystal Bridges in Arkansas. Do you see as well? Yeah, she is. Uh, really incredible. Uh, if you get the chance to see her art, you might actually have a good chance to see it in Japan just because there's always something going on and she's either behind it or influenced it or advised it. So yeah, the name is Yayoi, Y-A-Y-O-I. Uh, Kusama, K-U-S-A-M-A. -A. I can't good. Can't remember. I can spell it. It's, it's tricky. Just like her name is all vowels, <laughs> so, and then vowels, you know, they kind of squish together in Japanese. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sure some people, some like fluent Japanese people, might be able to say it in just a way that I don't even understand. But like, yeah, yeah, yo, yeah, it's tricky. And then, whenever I see Kusama, I want to say like Kazuma or something like that, like a more standard name. Kusama is her last name, her first name. I always forget because they're kind of shown differently, where depending where you look online. Um, so it's hard to know what someone's first or last name is in Japanese, unless you know specifically, okay. And, oh yeah, so I was talking, there are prime ministers, emperors, politicians, scientists, athletes, and artists. 
that have left their mark on Japanese history. Uh, and it would be interesting, I think, to if you want to pick, you know, a field that you're interested in, see who, what kind of, what if there's a Japanese person representing uh, Japan in that field. And we already know Studio Ghibli, so. Oh, true, yeah. In filmmaking, obviously, <laughs> Studio Ghibli uh, with, I'm blanking on his name right now. Me too. Uh, um, yeah, Miyazaki, Hayao, Hayao, another hard one, Hayao Miyazaki uh, and Studio Ghibli, great films. Okay, and so that's Japanese history. I do want to move on to foods. So uh, last time on the homework, I mentioned if you like would look up any Japanese foods that you might want to try, that would be interesting to maybe try to make yourself or just that you are look forward to eating. Uh, does anyone have anything that like stood out to them? Some like favorite food that you're absolutely dying to try? Yeah? Sushi. Sushi. <laughs> Classic. And you can find it everywhere. So you're in luck. Yeah. <laughs> Even in the United States, you know, we got um, good sushi. The sushi here is different than the sushi there. But I think uh, as long as you can find sushi that you enjoy, it's good to have, you know. Um, people aren't too snobby about, uh, you know, like, oh, that's, that's not the right kind of sushi. There are sushi conveyor belts, very common in Japan, where a dish will come by, it costs $1. With the current exchange rate, it costs like 45 cents. So, you know, there's cheap sushi, there's crazy high-end sushi, uh, but as long as it's sushi, it's good for me. I feel like I like it, however it comes. There's that cheesecake. There's a fluffy cheesecake mm -hmm. that I saw. It was apparently in, was it Kyoto? Yeah. How fluffy are we talking? Like, like pancakes fluffy? Like fluffy cake. Okay. Cheesecake. I've never it's, seen that because. It was, what was that? I have an opinion <laughs> about cheesecake in Japan. They make a cake and they put cheese in it. That's for the most part. It's not good. <laughs> but I'm sure some places that are really, you know, elevating their style. Of cheesecake that sounds really good like fluffiness yeah. usually you know i've gotten things like at school they give us a snack or something and they're like it's cheesecake i'm like this is a cheese flavored piece of bread <laughs> <laughs> like they really just put the name cheesecake into one thing um but kyoto is absolutely you can find really good stuff uh yeah it's cheaper, better at i would say the fish is definitely going to be fresher um because you can never be too like inland really in Japan. <laughs> I wouldn't trust sushi that I saw in like deep in the mountains. I'd be mean, like, where did you get that fish from? <laughs> you know, but uh, I might trust it more than like sushi in Texas. <laughs> it's like for instance. So uh, it's definitely gonna be good everywhere you try it there. Uh, whereas maybe here you might find some hit or misses. Yeah. yeah. Takoyaki, that's, yeah. That's the octopus balls. Uh, specialty of, I believe, well, kind of just major cities. I know Tokyo does it uh, and like Osaka does it as well. Uh, takoyaki is, is very good. It does, it tastes like octopus because there's octopus in there. So if that's not your thing, beware. It won't look like it has octopus in it. And then suddenly you'll take a bite and it's a very fishy, fishy flavor for something that's battered. So it might shock you, but it's very good. Uh, it will burn your mouth most likely, so be careful. It's very just, they serve it right off the, the grill. Oh, okay. It's the little balls, usually covered in like a sauce and then more fish flakes on top. Very fishy, very steamy, very good. Okay, I have a question from the virtual. It says, do they have a lot of street food and is it good? Yes, I would say the best time for street food is during mm -hmm. festivals. And you could even just, kind of, if you're going in the summer, which you guys are, if you're just walking and you start hearing, you know, some strange music, music some <laughs> bells jingling, and you smell something good, I recommend you follow that. <laughs> and, and they can be really small festivals or they could be really huge ones. And most of the time, they'll also end with fireworks in the summer. Mm -hmm. So if you see that, it's, it's a good chance to kind of catch a glimpse of a really authentic experience in Japan. Um, they have like baked potatoes there. They're really good. <laughs> They're really, really good. Um, I've, I've, just been traveling in a random part of Japan and I showed up to a random shrine and they had a, um, not even like a full festival, just a couple of tents at a very quiet little shrine that was giving away free sake, <laughs> like by the little shots. So uh, I was driving, I couldn't have any. My <laughs> friend was with me, was just downing them. You know, like thimbles full, but he was loving it. Um, 
and and really affordable food that you can try that's just the really authentic stuff other festival foods you'll see takoyaki you'll see like every kind of potato they'll fry it they'll be like the ribbon kinds you know um you might see squid a lot of foods do yeah. they have oh. another the a second part do they have a lot of chicken options in general chicken i think yeah you'll be able to find a lot of chicken options um I would say use some discretion. I have seen chicken that sounds really good, um, but it's like a Japanese take on a Western style and it kind of misses the mark. Okay. So I've seen like pepper chicken and you're like, that sounds fine. It was chicken completely covered in black pepper all the way around. Oh, I wouldn't recommend oh, yeah. it. Uh, I've had chicken sashimi, like mostly raw chicken and I didn't get sick from it. <laughs> but, uh, everybody else did so I think um I don't know something about maybe my my like food, my stomach fauna or flora or whatever could handle it more than like the Europeans that were with me but um just beware you know if someone says chicken it might not be exactly what you're picturing in your mind so maybe ask a, a follow-up question <laughs> um but uh the main thing is like fried chicken Japanese fried chicken is very good and you can find it in a lot of restaurants so it's like Korea uh it's it's different than korean style but okay. it's i think it's as common yeah and it would be karaage karaage is japanese right yeah very good uh karaage is k-a-r-a-a-g-e there's two a's together karaage uh very good i recommend that okay so that was foods that you were looking forward to i'm gonna try i'm gonna try it Yes, I was going to say, I do recommend that. I'll get to that in just a moment. So the, um, oh, no, no way. Absolutely not. You got to make it call. And it's a little bit tricky, depending. So uh, obviously the staple food in Japan, it's rice. So there are, there are plenty of bread options. Uh, you can definitely find like fresh bread at bakeries. You can find nice pastries and stuff like that. Um, a lot of people in Japan kind of criticize mm -hmm. Japan's bread. But their biggest problem is just sliced bread. They slice it too thick for sandwiches. And it doesn't like, you know, it's not very shelf stable. Like go here. Obviously, it's a good sign because it means it's fresh and it's not like full of preservatives. Um, but if you're like feeding a family, you don't want to buy a new loaf of bread twice a day or something like that. Like if you go through a loaf for breakfast, what are you going to have like later in the day? Right. Yeah. So uh, but I recommend try it as well. So, you know, the rice you're going to see everywhere. The bread that you we might see rice. in, yeah, rice. And it's good. Yeah. Usually you'll just get a bowl of steamed white rice. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that is accompanied by many side dishes around. So uh, it might be standard to get uh, like restaurant, maybe the seafood, a plate of like raw sliced fish and then a bowl of rice. Yeah, I know raw, the raw <laughs> sliced fish is a bit scary. But yeah, yeah, it, it's it's safe to eat though. Like you don't have to worry about getting sick. Uh, the only like maybe shellfish, you know, an oyster is an oyster no matter where you go. So be careful about that. Um, you know, obviously use discretion and be like, oh, geez, you know, they don't smell quite right or anything. But uh, yeah, definitely, I recommend trying uh, the fish. Obviously, you know, it's a giant island. They do fish every way imaginable. And they do it well. So I de definitely recommend fish. Um, and I really wouldn't worry about like, uh, if it's raw, I, I would fully place my trust that it's, it's gonna be all right. Uh, and delicious as well. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. So yeah, rice, uh, it might be called gohan uh, or just kind of plain white rice. And if you hear something else with the, like the little suffix there, han, will mean it's some kind of rice rice dish. So gohan is makes mo like just, it has the way it's written in Japanese is like the honorific kind of symbol that just means like the, and then han rice. So it's, yeah. that's the go-to rice, gohan. You might hear like chahan, which is fried rice, I believe. So if you get tired of the white rice, you don't want the gohan, you can go for chahan, like C-H-A-H-A-N, uh, you know, just to mix it up a bit. Rice is also goes by other names, so you might not specifically hear that, but 
it's something to look out for on the menu. If you're like, I like too much white rice, I'm tired of this, I need some rare, some variety, uh, you can go for that. Okay. Also, noodle dishes are very common in Japan. You might obviously know about ramen, but there are, that's just one kind of noodle, certain, you know, many types of broth, there's a lot of varieties, but that's just one kind. There's a lot more kind of noodle varieties uh, to try in Japan. I don't know if it is, I can't say ramen. Oh, oh you have a little ramen? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. So, um, udon is thicker. Yeah, udon is like the thicker, kind of more chewy noodles. Yeah. So, yeah. Soba is made with a different kind of flour and also kind of served in a different way. So, you can try ramen, udon, soba. Uh, yaki soba is very good. That's another festival kind of staple. So, yaki means like grilled. So, you will see it's kind of like they take the soba noodles after they're cooked, put them on a grill, mix them with a nice sauce, some vegetables, some meat, and kind of mix it all together and you get a little tray and you can take it and eat it as you walk around the festival. It's very good. Oh, and another one is a uh, sukemen, skemen. Uh, it's spelled T-S-U-K-E-M-E-N. T-S-U-K-E-M-E-N. Uh, men means noodle. You might see a lot of noodles, uh, like da men, met the men there means noodle. Suke men, the men also mean noodle. It, I'm not quite sure if it's just a certain kind of noodle or if it means noodle in general. But uh, if you hear like something, something men, you can assert, assume it's a noodle dish and kind of base it off there. They also do like just everything you can imagine with noodles. There's rice noodles, there's, you know, big long ones and thin ones, it's all great. And I recommend all of it. They do noodles very well. Uh, they also do pasta. You know, <laughs> there are Western style restaurants that will do pastas. Um, they're not very authentic, but they're uniquely Japanese if you wanna give that a try. <laughs> uh, I believe their version, they have a Neapolitan pasta. It's just ketchup, <laughs> but it's good, yeah. Okay, it says that ramen is cooked noodles in a bowl of heavy clamp soup whereas supermen are boiled and chilled and then placed in a separate bowl from the soup. Yes, I was going to say, that is <laughs> the beauty of sukemen is that it's served without the broth. So in summer, you might <laughs> notice that ramen is very, very steamy and you might get tired of it. So sukemen, I recommend, or you might just find restaurants that do brothless ramen. So they kind of cook it all together and then just put the ingredients there. And I think it's a different experience to ramen, but it is just as good. I really recommend it. Uh, especially, you know, you don't want your, it's so human though already, you don't want your glasses fogging up just from a meal, like it's, it gets crazy, yeah. Kakigori? Kakigori, yes, you, mm, even actually a festival food. So kakigori is shaved ice. Um, similar to what you might see here uh, in, you know, in essence, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's shaved ice with, you know, flavoring on top, but they go hard for it. So, the ice is shaved in a certain way where it's almost like a long snowflake, you know, it's very flaky instead of very like chunky as you might see here. Uh, the flavoring is just incredible, the variety of things. And some of them like matcha, um, dango, which is like a kind of mochi, a uh, red bean paste, they do, and then other kind of flavors you might recognize. They do a lot of great stuff. So if you get the chance, you've got like a bit of a sweet tooth, uh, kakigori is really good. So it's similar to the really Filipino. Good. Ice. Mm. Yeah, I think it's um, like the halu halu in Philippines, where you put the like the sweets and we put like the the milk. Yeah. The I think it kind of goes both like ways. It has yeah. both like the American like it's just ice with a flavoring, and then it has the like more like there's just whole ingredients in there. Yeah, you might feel like you know take a whole bit of mochi out of your ice and eat it. It's, it's good. So kake gori, I think k a k e g o r strict remember like is it kaki or kake i think it's kake because kori means kori means ice and kake is like to break it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah i didn't even put too many i didn't put any pictures of the food because i know you know we all just want to go eat dinner right now i'll just leave it to your imagination uh let's see little dishes and obviously seafood is very common but also fried food and it's generally um you know they have lightly fried like tempura stuff, that's good. They also have deep fried stuff if you really want something more substantial. Uh, and you can get that uh, like as, as sides at restaurants. If you go and get a bowl of ramen, you might be able to get 
a side of karaage and white rice. Like it's a lot of food, but it balances very well because you have something quite heavy with like the broth of the ramen. You have like a crisp chicken and then you, it's a bit greasy. So then you have the white rice and it's all a really balanced meal, balanced in flavors. I don't know if your doctor would agree. <laughs> yeah. There is one vegetable which lotus fruit. Lotus fruit. Yeah. And then there's also like tempura. I've seen that as well. Uh, I, I had it at like a chain restaurant, so it wasn't really that great, but obviously, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff like that. Lotus, you'll notice it because it's, it's, kind of it's got a bunch of holes in it. Like, um, I don't know, is there something that, like, it's like, it's hard to describe. Uh, it'll just have like, like a Swiss cheese vegetable. Like there's holes going through the center of it in a normal pattern. Uh, like the xylem and the phloem are huge, kind of like a lentil. It's not kind of, yeah. Honestly, it's weird to describe. It's yeah. Like well, I presume you can't find it in here. I don't think it's in the dryer. Yeah, that's that's a little bit strange. I don't know if it's loaded. But um, yeah, you might find they do like pumpkin, fried pumpkin, tempered pumpkin. That's quite good. Um, in terms of vegetables. Sure. There's a vegetable that you will either love or hate if you are lucky to experience it. It's called goya. Goya is bitter melon. Uh, it doesn't really look like a melon. It looks like a gourd, but it's bitter melon. Goya, G-O-Y-A. Like the brand. Like the brand, yeah. Stuff that's here. Did you say we're going to hate it? You will either love it or hate it ah. because it's very bitter. The name doesn't lie. It's yeah. bitter. Okay. Goya. Goya. Uh, some people just absolutely love it. Like they, they'll eat, you know, they'll just eat, take bites out of it raw. It's a kind of like tomatoes, I guess, like, but it's, it's bitter, really bitter. I like it in small certain quantities. dishes yeah. and small quantities, but if you told me like, take a bite out of Goya, I, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't do it for a month. It's, <laughs> this, it's, it's, oh, uh, okay. it's special. Yeah, I'll try it. It's like a challenge. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, it's a specialty in Okinawa. So um, you might, have to kind of seek out an Okinawan restaurant somewhere else in Japan to find it. And I honestly, I would recommend that just in general because the food in Okinawa is very different than the food on mainland Japan. So if you can look for an Okinawan style restaurant in Japan, you're gonna get like a mix of, of everything. It's a Japanese style restaurant, but they're serving completely different food. They have like pig ear salad, delectable. It's very, very good. <laughs> The Goya, they've got delicious like fried dough. It's so good. It's like, you know, like brown sugar fried dough donut. It. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. um, you know, for, for uh, the adults, they have very great uh, alcohol. It's Awamori, which is uh, uh, A-W-A-M-O-R-I, Awamori. I don't think y'all enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A W A M O R I, Awamori. It is so good. Uh, it's kind of got like a caramelly flavor, if you feel like very slightly at the end. What is it? What is it? A, a liquor? A liqueur? A, like mm, a, like a, a spirit? I believe it's some kind of probably like a potato wine. So kind of closer to like a vodka, but. Uh, but lighter, very good. <laughs> uh, I've seen people that will go to Okinawa and they'll bring back a three liter bottle and then a bunch of like smaller ones to give as gifts, but <laughs> it's popular. So that's a great one. Yeah, the gift giving culture is, uh, is pretty big yeah. in Japan. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously you guys are going as guests and you're going around. If like, if I was living there and I traveled, so I was in Hiroshima, if I traveled to Tokyo, I might be expected to bring back a little souvenir for everyone at the office. I think my office had like 47 people oh in there. Gosh. So you have to really plan around for it. Mm. Like I, I went to Tokyo, the specialty in Tokyo is Tokyo banana, mm. like Tokyo banana. It's, um, it's not a banana. It's a little banana shaped like sweets, kind of like it's like a cake, kind of, uh, it's like a, like a, a Twinkie. Oh, it's like a Twinkie, yeah. Okay, we'll Yeah, uh, and it's it's got, you know, like banana flavored, vanilla, chocolate, the basics. 
but it's the specialty that people bring back from Tokyo. And every kind of like big city will have something like that. Uh, and you had to bring back boxes of that to hand out at your office. Oh yeah, I brought a lot. <laughs> I, I think I spent, you know, they, you'll, you'll see this in train stations and in like the major areas. There's just stacks and stacks of boxes and they'll have like a nice presentation. It's usually like little cookie, like cookie mm -hmm. sandwich cakes, you know, tiny things like that. Matcha flavored and so on. Uh, rice crackers also are a great gift. It's good because it's something like kind of fairly cheap for like individual and you know you have to get a lot because if it's like, you know, for 50 people and if it's good, you want to get some extras for yourself. So <laughs> yeah, that might also be something to like try out in Japan. If you go past the train station, you see something like, uh, you know, it's going to be in a fancy display case right there uh, when you get off the train or like leaving the station. Uh, that's usually the local specialty uh, if you want to try it out. Okay, we need to make a note of that. What? That we need to make sure that we're looking for the local special. Ekiben, yeah. Ekiben. I'm making notes. Uh, it's like loved and hated. Some people, <laughs> just because there's a variety, you know, it's kind of like anything you're like, you'll have a favorite. So Ekiben is kind of to go bentos that you buy at train stations for when you're going on a longer uh, like bullet train ride. So, you know, if you're going from Tokyo to Osaka, it might take something like four hours. So you're going to want to take some snacks on the train. And it's perfectly fine to eat uh, kind of once you're underway. <laughs> so, yeah, like Ekiben, you know, it'll have rice, some protein, some vegetables. Uh, and just look for what's selling well, because that's going to be the one that tastes the best. If there's one that's kind of like not touched, steer clear, it might be cold or old. Yeah, that's just generally the rule for Ekiben. Just look for what's popular and hope you can get one. Because the other yeah. ones are not popular. All right. Okay. Oh, also, I did want to talk on okonomiyaki. That is one of my favorite foods in Japan. It's very hard to spell. Okonomiyaki. It's O. Oh, I'm just going to write it yeah, up. Yeah, tell me what it is first. It's a savory pancake. Yes. Um, it's not the same way in that, like, uh, the Korean kind of, like, savory pancakes are, because those have, like, a batter mixed with things directly in them. Okonomiyaki, there are two styles, Osaka style and Hiroshima style. I, I like Hiroshima the video style. on how they, they were making this on Facebook. Is that the, yeah, it's like so the, it's, the oh, cabbage? It's like layered, yeah, noodle. Well, Hiroshima yeah. style is like noodles, pork, cabbage, lettuce, batter, delicious sauces. It was delicious. It's very good. <laughs> I recommend the Hiroshima style. It's also like the bigger one. So like you can share it. Uh, it's more customizable, I think. And they do everything. It's like, I want, you know, egg, ham, squid, just anything you want in there. Uh, and you can really pick and choose and customize that. Uh, and, oh yeah, it's cooked. It's all cooked. Think of like an omelet, except that mm, it's, yeah. it's pancake instead of... You know. Pancake is like an overused word for describing foods, right? But like, yeah, it's like, uh, it's, it's cooked on a pan, so it's like a pancake. It's very good. So okonomiyaki, I need to write it out to spell it. That was fancy. And then Mr. Miyaki. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so O-K-O-N-O-M-I-Y-A-K-I. Uh, it's, it's even hard to say like when you're ordering it. Okonomiyaki, it's, it's a long one. Is it expensive? No, I would say for a big one, I... I, I would get it fairly often, probably like nine dollars or something. And it's a lot of food, so you it's will be absolutely full. It's your money's worth for sure. Oh. Yeah, every like food is fairly affordable in, in Japan. I've heard that most like college students will never cook, ever, uh, and it's perfectly affordable for them to do so. I think my um, my former manager when I was working in Japan, I asked him like, you know, he was living in going to school in Tokyo, and I was like, how kind of was that? uh like was it difficult to live alone and he was like no i just went to a restaurant every single meal <laughs> uh, and like as a college student so not a whole lot of money and he was like that's perfectly fine so the food shouldn't be too expensive unless you just always go for like the highest you know range stuff uh i would kind of sparse it out like if you wanted to try like the really nice wagyu beef probably don't have that every meal because it's really going to eat into your budget but you know sp spend the money to have it once really nicely uh, and then just try everything else because there's yeah. a lot of interesting stuff to try. And you don't want to blow your whole food budget on like, you know, a $500 steak. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, yeah, nice. it's good, but it's not that. <laughs> you hear about the street. Hmm. Like, <laughs> the street food, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see it. They also do one of my favorites is melon ton. Uh, so it's like it's a it's like a little bread. Um, if you know like Mexican kind of breads where it's got like the mm. sugar on top, it's something like that. Oh, conchas. Yeah, like conchas. It will it tastes a little bit like melon, but it's mostly something sugary. It's really good. So melon bread, melon pan. It's very good. Uh, sometimes I know in in Kyoto, near Kyoto Station, there's a place where you can get fresh baked melon pan with like a scoop of ice cream inside. Ooh. Amazing. So yeah, keep a lookout for that one. Kind of like a donut? Or is it more like a it's I guess it would be like a donut, like a like stuffed a, donut. <laughs> It's not very stuffed. Like it's just a, a bread that donut. has flavoring, yeah. But it's I guess it's stuffed when you put the ice cream in it. So melon pan, highly recommend. We're just gonna make a big old like bingo sheet <laughs> and like yeah. it off. And... Okay, so for there's also as I said, kind of local specialties. Uh, a lot of people, uh, like in the hospitality and travel with Big Bull oh, well, they'll be able to name off all the local specialties for that area. So it's great to ask around for those, um, you know, asking for recommendations, you'll find the, you'll, you'll probably get some kind of really good local recommendation. Um, the word to ask, I, sh I didn't make a note of this, but I just remember, the word to ask for someone's recommendation is also sume. It's uh, it is O-S-O-S-U-M-E. It is O-S-O-S-U-M-E. Um, you know, you could form a whole sentence and ask, you know, perchance, what do you have? <laughs> like, but you could just say ososume and kind of in a questioning tone and they'll tell you what's good. So that works, ososume, if you're really not sure what to get. Uh, and there's also national chains that I would say are worth, worth trying out. Um, even like McDonald's in Japan, they have stuff that you have never heard of over here. and It's all like limited time stuff. So definitely, you know, it's a good chance. Try out McDonald's. I know it seems like a very like maybe American touristy thing to be you know, looking for the American embassy, where are the golden arches, but <laughs> it's really good in Japan just because of the different variety. Like, you know, the basic stuff is the same. You'll be able to get cheeseburger and fries and Coke, it's all the same. But then they have like the samurai burger yeah, or something yeah, like that. Teriyaki. Or like the yeah, teriyaki burger, the ebi katsu, it's like a fried shrimp burger, mm -hmm. all really good. And worth trying and then they have like good desserts special like mcflurries it's good <laughs> um another chain restaurant that i recommend in japan is called coco coco ichibanya curry it's just going to say coco like c-o-c-o -C -O, coco uh that is a japanese style curry so curry and rice it's a uh, very good <laughs> And it's also kind of very easy to eat. So if you feel like you're kind of having like a roller coaster of food and you just want to have something uh, kind of more easy on the stomach, it's just white rice with a side of curry. And it's not like crazy spicy curry or anything. Very palatable, palatable sauce. Sorry. What was this? Uh, Coco Ichibanya. Coco Ichibanya. But that's, it's like written in kanji. You won't even go. Yeah, just look for Coco, C-O-C-O. Uh, and then, you know, their logo, the logo is a big plate of curry. Um, curry, uh, you know, it's it's like a stew with a lot of spices and it's kind of like a thicker kind of thing, like usually like a very brown sauce. Is it earthy sort of mm. taste to it? Slightly, slightly earthy. It's not gonna be like really, really sweet or really, really rich, like like bacon or something like that. It's more- It's a really hearty meal. Like it's a, it's kind of like, a lot of like Japanese people will call that like their childhood favorite, you know? Yeah, it's like, you know, it's like a chicken noodle soup here. It's a very basic kind of delicious thing. Mm, it's served with white rice, yeah. Okay, and let me see what else I got here. Oh, there's also like uniquely Japanese fast food restaurants that serve interesting things. Even if you don't want to try it, it might be cool to take a look. There's <laughs> Moss Burger, M-O-S Burger, which is their, one of the kind of Japanese burger restaurants. Some people don't like it. I think it's decent. <laughs> um, and you'll just kind of see that everywhere. There's also Yoshinoya. Uh, Yoshinoya, Y-O-S-H-I-N-O-Y-A. That's like a 
what they call it, like a beef bowl restaurant. They have rice with kind of cooked beef and you get all your toppings, you can get kind of different things. Um, that's quite good. And there's another one similar to that. It's like their less popular competitor. I can't even remember the name. So Yoshinoya is the one to go for. Uh, Matsuya is kind of similar. M-A-T-S-U-Y-A, -S Matsuya is good. Uh, oh, I forgot to give some flashcards over here real quickly. Yeah, is pretty good. Just quick food too. So if you're not into food for like a, a whole kind of evening of a sit down restaurant, if you're like, I want to eat something, I want to get something in my stomach and then go lay down. Uh, Matsuya and Yoshinaya for that, yeah. I don't really care I haven't even heard of that one actually. But that's good. I know in like uh, taiyaki is like a fish baked pastry that's quite good. Taiyaki, I recommend that one. Yeah, like taiyaki. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've seen things similar to it, just like a skewered fish, and it's the whole fish on a skewer. It's quite good. Um, okay, we have talked about food for a long time. <laughs> uh, so I'll just speed through and try to take much more time. Uh, if you want to learn kind of other Japanese dishes on Netflix, there are a few series, uh, Tokyo Midnight Diner. It's kind of, um, it's funny because it's like, it's the story of this diner that opens at midnight. So they serve kind of late night customers and they'll usually have some interesting backstory and they'll ask for a specific dish. And the, the restaurant's kind of gimmick is that they'll cook anything. Like it doesn't matter if he has the, uh, the ingredients or not, he'll like make anything that you ask for. Uh, and it's a lot of kind of authentic kind of Japanese foods and things that people kind of like in their childhood. So you can get a taste for what people eat over there through that. Tokyo Midnight Diner on Netflix. Okay. Yep, chain restaurants and online. Uh, another way to get food is convenience stores. That is really big in Japan. They're called Honbini. Mm. You can see here is the katakana because it's, it's convenience shortened into Japanese, so konbini. Mm -hmm. uh, the main ones are going to be 7-Eleven, Family Mart, and Lawson's. And they're all very good. They're very clean. They're very well stocked. I feel like if you're uh, in the United States and you go into a 7-Eleven, it's like a coin toss of how your experience will be, you know, uh, depending on where you are. But in Japan, these are all always going to be like a pretty solid spot for anything you might need. They're very well stocked for like, you know, you could be out of socks and they'll have it there, but you can also buy coffee and quick snack and get your like, you can fax and stuff there. Uh, so the Konbini, I recommend you get acquainted with them because they might just really uh, save your butt while you're over there. You know, it's gonna be hot. So like sports drinks, they have some good ones, yeah. So some question. Do you know what time they would normally close around? A lot of them are 24-7. Okay. You, yeah. If Oh, and they're very common. So you might show up to a street corner and three of the corners, like at an intersection, are different company. Like it might be all three competitors right there. Uh, so and at least one of those is going to be open 24-7. So uh, you don't have to worry about that. And if you get to one that's closed, walk another minute and you might find one that's open. They're really common in big cities. Uh, and they're very useful like, you know, sunscreen, anything if you, uh, if you like, you know, tear your shirt, they'll have a sewing kit there. They have everything you need at the Konbini, uh, very useful. And the food there is not too bad. You know, it's a lot of quick food, sometimes just like refrigerated meals at the microwave for you. But even that is, is solid if you're in a rush. Uh, like I would, on my way to work, stop, get one, put it in the fridge and it's ready for lunch. And it's just completely fine. It's not like, um, it's not looked at weirdly if you have like convenience store food. People are like, oh, that's my favorite. Like, you know, <laughs> it's really common. They'll be like, oh, did you get this one? It's not special. And they have, uh, I recommend them as well because they have interesting like snacks that you can try. You know, chocolate that's only kind of sold, like Pocky and stuff like that you can find there. Um, there's a really great chocolate bar like called Black Thunder. It's great. It's like a chocolate bar and an Oreo mm -hmm. all mixed in one. It's so good. 
and they have even an ice cream cone for it, like a popsicle. It's oh, so good. Yeah. Black Thunder. Yeah. It's great. He's writing that one down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it might be like Urak Sanda. Is how it might be written like in Katakana, but Black Thunder. You'll see it because it's like, it's a really dark packaging, like a thunderbolt, but like a nice <laughs> thing. So. so the kombini is going to come in handy, mm -hmm. like when, when we're coming out at the end of the night and after we're oh, done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we're hungry. We want something to eat. <laughs> if, you're, if you're like, you know, traveling, a kombini might be like your number one spot. If you're really like packing it tight with the schedule and just mm -hmm. going place to place, they might save your life. Yeah. I also heard there are not very many trash cans, but mm -hmm. you can find a place to throw away the trash yeah, public trash cans are kind of rare in Japan. There's a whole history with like a terror attack that happened and they don't use them anymore. But uh, train stations and convenience stores are your best bet for trash, like for throwing it away. Uh, it is general courtesy to, if you kind of produce any trash, to just keep it on your person until you find a place to throw it away. You know, I didn't like that. Yeah. And it, uh, you know, you might find a street corner in like Shibuya in Tokyo that's just a mess with trash. But that's definitely the exception because for the most part, you know, a train isn't going to have any trash on it unless someone like fell asleep and forgot their bottle or something like that. Um, and it wouldn't be like, you know, it's spilled all over seats. Like it's a sealed bottle placed neatly that they just forgot, not like just dry everywhere. So uh, yeah, you are going to want to keep hold of your trash until you find a company for the most part. And they've got like bottle recycling and separated into Burnables, not burnables. Okay. And oh, is that everything for that? Yeah, so that's convenience. <clears throat> um, just into food etiquette. You might see here there are kind of two ways that's like a traditional seating. The one on the left is just a cushion on the floor. That one can be really hard on the knees. So it might take a lot of like, you know. You might have to stand up and take a break. You might have to go from like crisscross to kind of stretched out. Um, and if you think it might be difficult for you, uh, you could probably ask for a, like a, a table with chairs. They might have both available there. And on the right is something similar where you're still sitting on the floor, but they have like a cutout for your legs. So it's a little mm -hmm. tricky to get in and out of that seat, but uh, much more comfortable. There used to be a restaurant here in Roanoke that ha was that was like that. It was Shogun. Oh, were you like, would you be in there? It was, they had traditional seating, yeah. but it's not there anymore. It mm -hmm. used to be on Williamson. Like, it just is not. So yeah, just be aware, uh, it, you know, okay. it can get really hard to sit in that position. Also, right. if you're like at a tea ceremony, it might be sitting on the floor like the one on the left. So be aware. It can be a, a long time, either kneeled or sitting on the floor. So just be ready for it. Maybe train, train up the stamina for that. <laughs> okay, and uh, for chopsticks. So there are some general rules for chopsticks. Um, if, you, if you have, if you go to a restaurant, you might see either like the wooden chopsticks that are stuck together or like separate plastic ones. If you get the wooden ones, some people might tear them apart and like rub them together, you know, do this and that. Um, it's generally seen as like, a bit rude to do that because it's like you're telling the person that their chopsticks are cheap. Like they're gonna have like, you know, <laughs> splinters and stuff like that, yeah. Isn't it um, bad luck to not use chopstick correctly? Uh, I think there is a part of that. Yeah. If you put your chopsticks <laughs> down and like a bowl of rice sticking straight up, just like both of them together straight up, that's, it's like similar to something that's done at a funeral. So it's, bad manners and it's probably bad luck as well you know to, to stick them just straight up like that because it looks like a little grave or something uh usually a place that gives you chopsticks might also give you a chopstick like rest like a little thing to put them on or just you know in your plate on a, in a normal manner but it, you know don't jab them in there uh and for passing uh it's also considered rude to pass food directly from chopstick to chopstick um I don't know how good you guys are with chopstick. It might be, you know, it's pretty tricky to like pass a piece of fish between chopsticks. But um, just generally, there's like extra plates. Put it on the plate, put it on someone's plate, and then they pick it up. Passing from chopstick, it's it's bad manners because you're likely to drop it. You know, yeah. even Japanese pool, it's two little sticks in, in midair. You're likely to drop it, and then you're wasting food and making a mess. So just try to avoid that one. Oh, and 
chopsticks in Japanese are called hashi, hashi, so like that. Uh, you might see the kanji for it. Um, but if, uh, if you ask for hashi, they'll know that you're talking about chopsticks. Uh, and if you can't use them or you don't like to, uh, they can also have spoons and forks. You can ask. Um, in Japanese, spoon is like spoon. So just say spoon and they'll know what you mean. Um, fork, they might just offer it if you're having trouble with chopsticks. I believe it's full food. Well, I think it might be good. <laughs> okay. And uh, important ones here. So at the beginning of a meal or even just like a snack, when you're going to eat a food, uh, you might say, or it's very normal to say, itadakimasu. The U is kind of silent. So itadakimasu. And basically it means the like meaning of it when you say it is like, thank you for the meal. And uh, directly translated, it's something like, I, I like humbly receive. So you might hear the word, like the base of the word itadaku, that's used for someone who's like, you know, you might hear it in like a, in Japanese, they might say like, we need to like take that opportunity. And they might use like itadaku because it means like to take or to receive. But itadakimasu is said before a meal. People often like their hands together, itadakimasu. Um, <laughs> it's tricky, you might want to practice that one. The next one is quite longer. So at the end of the meal, you're going to want to say, gochiso sama deshita. Hmm. Say that again. Yeah. Gochiso sama deshita. Gochiso sama deshita. Gochiso sama deshita. No, I don't think there's an expectation to say it, but um, you know, when you finish a meal, uh, uh, an even better example is when you're leaving a restaurant, you might want to say, you might be like tempted to say thank you, like arigato, but the correct thing to say is gochiso sama deshita, because you're saying thank you for the meal, more specifically than if you left the restaurant and you said thanks, you're saying thank you for the meal, is the meaning there. So gochiso sama deshita. Uh, these, these two might take a lot of practice, because they have like repetitive sound, really long. Okay. No. And let's see. Yeah, so itadakimasu, thank you for the meal, or sorry, I humbly received, so it's like, thank you for preparing this, and then gochiso sama deshita, for thanking them for the meal. I'm trying to write it. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a lot. They're long. And that's because they're kind of like polite words. The more polite you are in Japanese, the longer the words can be. That's how it works. Yeah, really? <laughs> um, it's ta. I don't remember what knee looks like. No, knee would be the line without the dash on top. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's see what we got next. That language, we don't have a lot of time. Um, so I'll, I'll keep talking, but if any of you have to leave, you know, we're recording it and these are available online because uh, right now we're looking at 610. So our topics are greeting, goodbyes, and numbers. Ooh, this might take a little bit, so apologies. <laughs> uh, there's only like five more slides. Okay, so we're doing greetings, goodbyes, and numbers. So for greetings, yeah, the most common one you might know, konnichiwa, uh, that, that works, but it's actually a time-specific greeting. So konnichiwa is what you use during, like basically from noon until evening, and then there's one for the morning and there's one for the evening. So let's see. Oh, and also with your greetings and kind of any kind of Japanese speech, there is casual and polite forms of speaking. Uh, so casual and formal. Formal, you probably won't have to use on this trip specifically. That's more like if you're living in Japan, uh, working in Japan, you would use formal speech when speaking to someone who is older than you, who is in a higher position than you, basically like someone who is senior in some kind of way. And like I said, formal Japanese just means making things longer and more complicated. And whereas casual things can be pretty short and easy to remember. So for the morning, we say, Ohio gozaimasu. Ohio gozaimasu. Is that the casual or the formal? Uh, if you just go with Ohio, 
that's casual. And it sounds like the state, right? Ohio. It can literally be like Ohio. And then gozaimasu. It's a longer thing, but it really is just a formal ending. Uh, so, you know, casually, you could say someone in Ohio, or you could, you know, if I was walking into my job, I might say like, Ohio gozaimasu and give a little bow, you know, because my manager's there or something. And that's used in the morning. Uh, there are more casual ways to say it. Um, you know, people like, you know, the big bosses, when they show up, they're not gonna give the same level of like formal respect to everyone below them as the people below them would give up. So, you know, I've seen some older managers walk in and instead of like an Ohio gozaimasu, they're like, assess. <laughs> like that's it. They just shorten it so far. Like a lot of casual speech is just taking out a bunch of syllables mm -hmm. and getting the, you know, the beginning, a sound in the middle, and the ending. Um, kind of like with arigato. Arigato means thank you. You can make it more polite by saying arigato gozaimasu. And then some people make that casual by just taking the beginning and the end. And of arigato gozaimasu, they'll say asas. <laughs> and that's like a very formal, a uh, very casual, like, thanks. Thank you. That's a separate support. Mm, so domo, domo is, yeah, domo is uh, another way to say thank you. I but it elevates it, right? I'm, I'm not too sure, just because I haven't heard a lot of people actually say it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, I think it might be something that went out of style a bit, um, I think. Because if you think about it, everything that kind of says that is like from the 80s. Uh, oh. And speech changes, you know, people don't talk yeah. the same way. So you could still say domo, people would definitely understand it. Domo, domo arigato. <clears throat> I think domo arigato gozaimasu is like, you're just fumbling now. It's like, <laughs> uh, it sounds like you're kind of like, thank you, like it's a lot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, domo is good. And then arigato gozaimasu, you might, you're gonna see a lot and it just means like, you're being more polite when you say it. Politeness. Okay, so Ohio is for the morning. In the day, you would use konnichiwa. So basically, mm -hmm. from noon until probably konnichiwa. sun goes down, it's konnichiwa. Uh, you'll notice uh, if you've been studying the hiragana, the last letter there is actually ha, it's an H A, but it's pronounced wa. This is because uh, it basically, it's kind of like goodbye. You know, it used to mean, it used to be a different phrase that kind of changed over time to mean goodbye. So goodbye is like, God be with ye. And then they change it to like, good be with ye and then goodbye. This is kind of similar. Konnichiwa means like, today is. But it meant that a long time ago. Now it just means hello, basically. And the wa is a particle that kind of stuck into that. And even though it's written differently, keeps that sound. So konnichiwa. Uh, so the one that is... Mm -hmm. Ohio. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Ohio is for the morning. Konnichiwa is for kind of like at from at from noon till evening. And then, yeah, it's all hello. Yeah. They both mean hello. So that's what I'm saying. There's it's um, different ways to say hello at different times. Depending of the day. on the time of day. The same way where you might say, you know, good morning. This basically means good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good night. But they're all just means hello. You know, they're just time sensitive. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the last one for nighttime, so something we would use right now, konbanwa. 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 Uh, and it, it follows the same kind of theme as konnichiwa. Konnichiwa means like this day is konbanwa is night. Ban means night. On means this, and wa is like a particle. You don't really have to remember that, but ohayo, konnichiwa, konbanwa. Good morning, <coughs> hello, and good evening, something like that. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, you'll get compliments if you use the right one at the right time. Basically, people are going to think you're very good at Japanese if you know that if it's 10 in the morning, you say ohayo instead of konnichiwa. Or if, you know, if the sun's gone down, konbanwa, people are going to be like, wow, very good. So <laughs> you're really impressed with that one. Are talking to you and you have no idea what they're saying. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I will practice with my virtual Zumba students that, that join because I have a lot of Japanese that join. Are they in Japan or are they? Some are in California, some in Japan. Okay, yeah, you can just say, oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I can practice with them. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. Where they are, we could see all of them in one meeting. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> be a lot of repetition that way. Yeah. Okay. And oh, so next we have for goodbye. So this one is less time sensitive, and I would say more related to duration. So how long you're saying goodbye for. People might know sayonara. That means goodbye forever. I'll never see you ever again. Basically. Okay. Like when I left my job and I was giving you my farewell speech, I, or like my schools, I would say like sayonara, because I don't know when I'll see them again. It might be years, it might be never. Uh, it's not that commonly used. I guess, unless you're in a situation where you're leaving people for a long time. And that is another area where we are completely incorrect then. Yeah, people sure. say it just like, bye, but it's from movies, you know, if someone, if some samurai is going to kill another one, I don't know, I've seen you never. Basically. Yeah, something like that. Like, it, it's, it's a dramatic way of speaking that you would use in real life if you were actually trying to add that level of like sincerity. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I, like I have had to say like goodbye basically forever because I don't know when I'll I'm gonna, uh, just like, I'm sorry. I'm flabbergasted <laughs> by that because I was not expecting it. Mm, yeah, so. yeah. Um, so the, the the casual ones are something that you might use more. Children say bye bye. And it's just spelled you. like it is like yeah. well it's B-A-I-B-A-I, -I -I, but it, it's bye bye, it's pronounced the same. Um, you yeah. might see like little Japanese school kids and they'll try to talk to you. You won't understand what they're saying. Even if you spoke Japanese, you wouldn't understand what they're saying because they're like four-year-olds. They just talk gibberish. Oh. But then they'll say, bye-bye. And you'll be like, oh, okay, bye. <laughs> you'll know what they're saying. <laughs> um, so that's a good one. Another one is Jane. Uh, so, you know, if it's it read together, it looks like Jane, but it's Jane. Jane. Um, and then that one can kind of be combined in other ways. Ja basically means like, well, <laughs> you know, you're just like, well, it's time to be going now. So if you're like, ja ne, well, it's like, well, see ya. And then kind of more longer is like, ja matta ne, which is kind of expecting to see them again at a pre agreed upon time. Matta means like later. So that's, I'll see you later. <laughs> you know, you'd say that when you do expect them to see, like to see them again later. Um, and you can also kind of combine it. So if you see, if you know you're going to see someone tomorrow, if you're saying goodbye for now, you could say, mata ashta. That is like until tomorrow, basically. So, you know, while you're learning, you might learn words for like tomorrow, next week, next month, things like that. Uh, but the base of it is you're going to be ja, to kind of start your goodbye. Mata is just later, and then you can add things to add more time. So, ja matane, or just matane, is like, I'll see you later. Uh, and that's, that's casual. Yeah, yeah, it's used anime because it's, it's just a casual way of speaking, yeah. It's something that students would say to each other and stuff like that. Um, the formal ones are kind of more niche circumstances. Uh, you probably won't have to remember these. It might be very impressive if you do for the people you speak to. So, otsukare sama deshita is kind of like, it basically means like, you're tired, is what it's saying. But it's, it's saying, you've done a good job. Thank you for your work. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you do experience someone kind of going above and beyond to help you, it might be appropriate to say like, otsukare sama deshita. That's, uh, it's like a very polite and sincere thank you for someone putting in effort. Um, so this might be something that we actually say to our tour guide. Yeah, I think that would be a, a perfectly appropriate uh, time to use it because you know they've put in this effort to make a nice experience for you. And that's a very kind of both respectful and appropriate way to say thank you uh, and goodbye. Kind of, if you, you know, it might be the last thing you say. Um, it's also like business people might say it like if, uh, if they get off of work and they go meet for drinks, they'll all just cheers with otsukare like shortened version or it's got it's got sama and that's basically you know they don't even if they don't particularly work together they're all just saying like good job you made it through the day it's got sama that that's character is so complicated yeah uh this <laughs> what would it yeah. be it would be that way yeah the character for being tired you'll get tired when you finish writing it <laughs> and then this one is sama so like uh, any 
uh, like <clears throat> if you use any Japanese services, they might call you like so and so sama. Mm -hmm. uh, I I still get like letters uh, from time to time from from when I lived over there, and they'll be like Cisnero sama. Like they're very polite because sama basically means like God. Like you are, <laughs> but it's just being very respectful to customers and stuff like that. Um, and it's used like when addressing letters to people and stuff like that. So you might see like your name with this character after it, and it just means it's addressing you politely. Uh, the next one is it's kind of uh, it's used for when you're leaving for the day, but you're expecting to come back. Uh, so if you're staying at like hotels or something, it probably won't be useful. But if a person was, you know, leaving and coming back, might say itekimas, itekimas. Itekimasu. And it means I'll be back. It means I'm going and coming. Because it's a uh, ite going, kimas coming. I'm coming and go I'm going and coming. And there is like a a response that people should say, which I always forget because I lived alone. So I have to say it to anybody. Let me see. Oh yeah. So if someone says itekimas, the, you know, if there's someone home still, they'll basically say, you know, see you later, be safe. That is, uh, what I forget, iterashai. Iterashai. It sounds very similar to what you, you might hear when you walk into a restaurant in Japan. You know, they say, like, irashai mase. They're welcoming you um, in a very, like, specific word that's not used in common word. But irashai mase and iterashai have the same base, so welcoming you. Uh, and there's other ones like that. There's, there's a common response basically for when you leave and when you come back, uh, which is kind of fun that you can look up and learn. Yeah. Yeah. So when people come home, they might say, and that means I'm back. And then, like, you know, whoever's still home would say, or uh, those are like everyday greetings and like goodbyes in Japanese. That you that Japanese people use, but as a tourist, you might not experience. But it's you know it's helpful to learn kind of that relationship in the home. Where if you're leaving, you don't leave without saying anything. You say a very specific phrase, and you say a very specific phrase back. Weird. Okay. We uh, do it in English too. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm you coming back. <laughs> so. Going into numbers, uh, it looks kind of crazy, but it is actually a pretty simple system. Uh, and it will help if you kind of practice. I think it's, it's pretty quick to, to get a grasp on it. So one through 10 are the base of the entire number system. And the way that uh, you kind of make larger numbers is just adding them together. Um, but not mentioned on here is zero. Zero has two ways of saying it, but for the most part, you can say zero which is just zero, but you pronounce the vowels in the Japanese way, zero, and people understand that. So for one, uh, we've got ichi, ichi, two, ni, ni three, san, san or yon. yon. Uh, it has also shi, uh, but usually you're gonna wanna say yon. Shi is another way to say it, but it kind of sounds like other ones. So it's good to know, but uh, like for instance, ichi, shi, they have the same ending and kind of like, it's kind of close. So if you just take a peek down at seven, ichi. So if you have ichi, shi, shichi, it's very confusing. So yeah, you stick to the alternate say. Hmm. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of like unlucky. Yeah, if, if you use it in the wrong context, yeah. like uh, in writing, yeah. So shi, shi means death with a different character, but so it's even kind of like, just stick to yon, you'll be fine. There. <laughs> yeah. But it, it just, just be aware, it does have a different one that you might hear in certain contexts. So you're ni san yon. I'm used to saying she, but I know it's not right. For five, go, go. go. Six is roku. Roku. Seven is nana. Nana. Nana, you can kind of stick to that one. It's easier than shichi. Hachi. Hachi. Eight, hachi. 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 Nine is Q. 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 Sometimes you might hear it as Q. Q. So Q or Q, Q, depending on the, the way that the number is being used. But you'll, you know, they're close, so we'll be able to hear that one. Q. Q. And 10 is Ju. Q. Q. So it's Ichi, Ni, San, Yon, Go, Doku, 
nana hachi kyu ju. If you said it with the, the, like, the alternates, it might be hard to say. If you're going ichi ni san shi goro shichi hachi kyu ju, you kind of have to have the uh, the mouthfeel for how to say them to not get stumbled up with that. It takes practice. So you don't imagine what it's still new. Yeah. So go through it like the path. There, there is context like it's usually read as yon unless you're counting from one to ten, and then you might say she. But counting to one to ten is something you don't naturally do all the time. You know, it's something you would ask like a little kid to do, like, oh, show me you one to ten. But uh, you know, in everyday life, you don't really have to do that that much. Oh, okay. And then moving on, the larger numbers are made by adding them together. So for instance, 11 is adding 10 and 1. Ju ichi. Yeah, and then they're all kind of same. Ju ni, ju san, ju yon, ju go, ju roku, ju nana, ju hachi, ju kiki, and then ju kyu. Now, it does get a little bit tricky here because you have to remember the order. If you put the smaller numbers before the 10, you're now making that a multiple of 10. So 20, is ni ju huh. two ten <clears throat> instead of ten two. <laughs> so you just gotta you gotta like you know put the wires together in your head. And, yeah. So like the, the teens start with ten because it's like ten and four ten and that. But then you're saying page says Roman numbers and this one plus subtraction. So three yeah. and ten. Yeah. Four and, and I've I've seen them know? like I've seen my Japanese students learn multiplication tables. They don't say times, they'll just say all the words together. And I'm like trying to listen to this fifth grader do like their, their, you know, their 10, no, the tens are easy, but like hear them do their nines. And they're like, what would it be? They're like, like they're just saying numbers in a row. And I'm like, what are you saying? It took, it took like five tries, but you need to slow down, slow down. And the kids are getting mad at me. Just sign my paper, I did it. <laughs> But that's elementary. <laughs> so it's like that from one to ninety-nine, uh, and then one hundred, it, it it changes up, and they just add another word, hyaku. Yeah. Hyaku is one hundred. Uh, hyaku is a bit of a weird one because when you're saying it with a number in front, like one hundred hyaku, two hundred ni hyaku, three hundred sambyaku the H turns into a B for the ease of pronunciation, basically. Uh, if you had to say san kyaku, it's kind of like two exhales in a row. It sounds a bit weird. So they close the mouth to make a different sound, san byaku. San byaku. And then uh, 800 is the same. So you go from 700 nana hyaku mm -hmm. to 800 ha pyaku. It's a P now because yeah. it's like, if you said ha hyaku, what are you laughing? You know, ha 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 ha. ha. <laughs> Just uh, they change it to, for, for ease of pronunciation. And there's also thousand, it's not on this chart. Thousand is sen, sen. So you might see that, you know, if you're paying with money, sen and a uh, thousand yen is about $10. So you might hear that one quite often. Uh, so it might be helpful to learn your higher multiples. But once you've got that system down, you can say all the numbers. So, you know, you could say, you know, Q, 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 99, yeah. <laughs> Uh, anything like that, you know. If you started going to hundreds, you could say, you know, Kyaku Niju 120. Um, it does, they get long, you know, because you have to say them all. So, like 2022 Nisen Niju Ni is the like current year. So, they start getting long as you're going on. And then they have words for 10,000, for a million, things like that. Okay. But that's numbers in a nutshell. Oh, and uh, a thing that is interesting about the numbers is because they have these kind of simple sounds, it's kind of common to hear a combination of numbers that sounds like a different word. For instance, two and nine, it might be read as ni ku. That's an instance where the q would turn into ku. Niku means meat. So a grocery store <laughs> on the 29th day of the month might have a sale on meat because people there, it's easy to remember, niku, it's meat day. <laughs> uh, go get your like half off steak or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, another one is um, three nine, thank you. Thank you sounds like thank you. Thank you. So like you might be like 
shorthand in texting, 3-9 means thanks, because it's thank you, thank and that you. means thank you. So that's a good one. They love number puns like that. Yeah, 3-9 means thank you. So number puns, things like that. Um, basically, number puns and onomatopoeia are like a lot of like the, the hidden intricacies of Japanese language. Onomatopoeia are huge and they're very specific. And then like number puns, it's great. Okay. Uh, and almost finishing up here, in terms of counting words, this is where numbers start looking like math. Like <laughs> it gets hard. So basically there's different counters depending on the things you are counting. Uh, and I cannot go into detail about it because you just have to learn it yourself. It's very difficult. Um, I would recommend like, you know, finding some documents. I'll recommend some in the next newsletter to help. Basically, if you're counting something small, you're like, oh, there's two erasers, then you would use the suffix ko. Ko means something small. So you have niko, two. Uh, there's a general purpose one for counting things. So if I was like, oh, how many chairs are here? Itsu, futatsu, mitsu, they, they change up the pronunciation and the ending. It's quite crazy. A good one is that age is pretty easy, even though it also has a, like example, like exceptions and stuff. Basically, you say the number and then sai, and that means years old. So I'm 20. Four, I always forget. <laughs> so I would be Niju Yon Sai. Niju Yon Sai. So you just take the number and you put Sai at the end, and that means here's a word. Uh, 20 is different. It, it has a special word because it is the age of majority in Japan. So it's kind of like, oh, you get a special word for this one year. It's um, Atachi, I believe. So if you're 20 years old, you would say Atachi instead of Niju Sai. <laughs> yeah and then um another one for one and eight they both kind of cut off the end so for one if you're one years old which none of you are you would say isai isai so it's like the ichi just cut off the chi so rather than isai, ikisai, it's isai. Yeah. and it's basically because it's easier to say isai. same for eight eight also has the chi so instead of hachisai asai and that rule continues upwards. So if you are uh, like 11, ju isai, instead of ju ichisai. If you were 18, ju hasai. If you were 21, ni ju isai. 28, ni ju hasai. Yeah. Uh, counting people is also different because one and two, one person is hitori. It also means alone. So literally one person means alone. Uh, two people is futari. And then after that, it gets easier because you just say the number plus ni. Ni is it's a symbol that means people. Basically. San ni. So yeah, from three up, san ni, yon ni, four ni, doku ni. So if you go into a restaurant and they ask how many seats, you know, if it's six people, doku ni. So that's a good one to use. San ni. Yeah. Yeah. for you yeah. guys. Yeah. And let's see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So two is a general one. And then there's really specific ones, like for large machines and cars, you use dai. So if there's three cars, san dai, you know, something like that. Han dai. <laughs> um, and then dai is also used, spelled differently for like first, second, third. Like ichidai, nidai, sandai, it also means like place. Like, I forgot, I, I looked up the right word for what that is. Ordinal numbers. Okay. Yes. Remember that one? Like first, second, third. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, and there's a lot. There's descriptors for long, thin objects like pencils and like planks of wood. There's um, counters for flat things like sheets of paper. So, there's a lot. They're all very specific. Um, you know, you learn it as you need it, basically. There's one for small animals, one for big animals. Hmm. It's, it's a whole thing, you know. You can make a whole class about it. Okay. And let's see. Okay, that's basically all. Uh, so sorry, definitely went over there on time. <laughs> it was less slides. But uh, a lot of information. We like to talk about food. Yeah, yeah. The food got us <laughs> on the <a> little bit. <laughs> so I would say... It's been an entire class. 
I mean, yeah, it could be what we do, but let's let's change it up. <laughs> um, yeah. So also on your flashcards, if you have anything that came to mind that you might want to see in later lessons, uh, once again, I'll take a look at those and add them into planning. Right now I'm plan. I have topics up to the next lesson uh, and I'll take things that we talked about today and some of your questions to fill in the next newsletter. But then, you know, from up to the fourth one on, well, you know, it's good to have your take on what else you guys want to know about. Okay. Uh, I think that's basically- Sorry, we ran over. Apologies. <laughs> um, if you want to practice using chopsticks, that would be that, you know, that might take you the whole month <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to get really good. They do make like practice chopsticks that like uh, the kids might use in the band. Like first. Yeah, they like you put your fingers in them and then it kind of helps so you can't drop them. Don't look at me. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you can look at some like guide to tell you how to hold it. And there's different grips too. So you might find that the, the regular way to hold chopsticks can work for you. There are other ways to hold it mm -hmm. that might give you a nicer grip. So that's good. Can they help you stand? Yeah. 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 That's what I was thinking. Oh, that's oh what yeah, I was thinking. That's another one. Yeah, you put the two individual chopsticks and basically a piece of plastic that connects them so that they can't both fall out of your hand. That's very helpful. Yeah. So recommend you, you practice that. So, you know, your food words that we learned, Kutzekta Mas, Kutzekta Samarishta, Kutzekta Samarishta, Kutzekta Samarishta, Kutzekta numbers, and so on. And I think for next lesson, I'm going to want to talk about places in Japan. I'll go over some major places and give some information on that. So, uh, you know, if you come next time prepared with some place that's like your, your absolute must go spot, uh, we might talk about that. So just kind of have that in the, in the back of your mind. So, Joshua would be to take a look at the itinerary um, for, uh, for our trip. See if there's anything in particular from each of those locations since we will be seeing them. So. You can get there in Tokyo. Yes. Okay. It's a little different now. Yeah. I think so. It's in Tokyo, so it's definitely doable. That'd be really cool. Yes. And Akihabara Station. We give them to Michael. Yes, he's got And are there any other questions? Yes, uh, they have gotten better because of preparation for the Olympics that didn't end up happening, but still restaurants are more prepared to handle allergies. Um, you can find like, you know, dietary restrictions are a lot more easy to accommodate than they were in previous years. So like, you know, allergies, shellfish allergies, yeah. gluten allergies. Um, things like that. Uh, I'll, I'll go over later, probably closer to if we're like write something down on how you can say that. To That's what we did. Yeah. Just, if nothing else, just for peace of mind. Yeah, because yeah, but it's, it's a little weird to say, but for allergy, it's aderugi. That's what you want. Aderugi. Yeah. But, um, and then, you know, you might, thank you for staying. I'll, 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 I